morning to you all. I must tell you how my morning has gone so far, just to give you a warning. It's one of those mornings where you wake up and you fall back asleep for another 30 minutes before you get up. And in that period of time, I had a dream that every place I walked in this building this morning, my pickup was following me, and none of the doors were big enough for it to get in. So it made an opening in every door in this church. So uh, what a nightmare. And I think, well, that's just a dream. Here just a little while ago, I'm drinking my tea, getting ready, and I slobber my tea all over my shirt. So I don't know how this morning's going to go. We're going to find out. We're here to worship our living Father this morning. It's good to see you out, those that are in the auditorium here with us. But we're glad to have you folk uh, with us on uh, FaceTime this morning, Facebook. Trust that you will uh, receive a blessing this morning from uh, the Word as it's opened up. Maybe there's some things going on in your life that will be an encouragement to you. Uh, we trust that we can be that encouragement. Remember, we are only a phone call away. If you have something that's on your mind, something that you need to add to the prayer list, whatever the case may be. Tonight at 5 o'clock, same place on the, the face to, uh, Facebook uh, for the evening service. And then once again on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock for our prayer service service. So make a point to attend and uh, we'll worship and uh, spend time with our Heavenly Father in those services as a group. And then uh, throughout the week we ask that uh, you will continue to pray for one another uh, during this time. And uh, we've got uh, several people that are on our prayer list with uh, sicknesses and ailments right now. Some with immune problems that uh, aren't able to get out. Please remember each and every one in prayer and uh, trust that you'll have a good week coming up. Let's bow in a word of prayer before we open our hymnals this morning. We want to praise our Heavenly Father. He's worthy of our praise this morning. So let's spend time with Him in prayer as we open up. Thank you, Father, <coughs> for the opportunity we have to be in Your house this morning. Thank you for the opportunity we have to worship You this morning. We ask as we do that, that you would be pleasing, that we would be pleasing of our worship to you. Father, we ask that you'd guide and direct, open our hearts up this morning, cause us to be open, receptive to your word, and we'll give you the praise and the glory in it all. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at number 66 as I open up God, uh, this morning. To God be the glory. That's who we're praising this morning. Stand with me, please. <coughs> to God. To God be the glory. Great things He had done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son. Jesus, a son, and give. 
377. Jesus, my cross have taken. 377. <coughs> Jesus, my, my cross have taken.
Jesus, gracious King of kings, singing this morning. You may be seated. Pastor? Amen. Been in a wrestling match with my microphone already this morning. Might mention tonight at five o'clock we will be doing our regular evening service and of course right now in the days in which we live, we will be doing it online, on Facebook. And so I'd encourage you to join us for that. I'm going to be teaching about the parable of the dragnet. And Joe Friday is nowhere in my sermon tonight, just so you know. Um, Wednesday night is our virtual prayer meeting. Um, one of the nice things, it, when we get back to regular prayer meetings, I think we're still going to do something on some night of the week for a prayer meeting. Um, we have people from all over the world that watch our prayer meeting. Um, and that's kind of exciting when you think about it, um, that we can have one another praying together no matter where you are. There's a guy that wakes up at 2 o'clock in the morning to watch our prayer meeting. Um, uh, which is, on a, I wouldn't wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning for anything. <laughs> Maybe a bad storm. I'm just saying that. But join us for that. If you would like a copy of the prayer list um, I compile, people send me prayer requests. If you would like a copy of that, let me know, and I can provide you a Microsoft Word copy of our prayer list. And if you need it in paper because you don't have email or you don't have internet, I can do that as well. But be praying about that. Isn't the Lord good? Amen? Amen. Think of the beautiful day that God has given us today. Isn't that something to rejoice in? If you've got nothing else to thank God for today, thank Him for the day that He's given you another life of life, another day of life, another opportunity to live for Him, and another opportunity to serve Him. I'd like to ask you to turn your copy of the Word of God to 1 Peter chapter 2. It is important that when someone is preaching, you take your Bible or your phone or your tablet and you follow them because there is a lot of false teaching out here and I look at some of the stuff they use and they give verses about and I go, and their conclusion I go, that's got nothing to do with that passage or the context of that passage. Don't just absolutely trust that everything that comes out of a preacher's mouth is correct or true. Follow the Word of God and you will never be steered wrong. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 18, the Bible says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable, if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, and because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Here is a command. In this passage is a commendation. And in this passage is a call to follow Jesus. You know, when I think about this passage, this is not an easy place in the Bible to follow. Especially when you look in the original language, the word servant is the word slave. What do we do? I know some preachers, when they're preaching through the book, if they get a passage they don't particularly like, they just skip over it. They don't preach that that week. Um, 
Beloved, let me share with you today. You don't treat this book like I was taught to eat snook in South Africa. When we were in South Africa, they caught a fish called snook. It's very, very tasty fish. They did a brie, which is a barbecue. Um, and they put a special marinade on it. I don't. I was told that that uh, the the only people in South Africa can, can cook fish like that are colored folk. And um, uh, and I said I'm going back. It, it it was excellent. There's only one problem with snook. Snook is a very very bony fish. All kinds of bones. And. Um, I asked, you know, I took my bite and I said, how do you eat this? And the individual said, you eat this, you take a bite, you, you enjoy the fish, but you spit out the bones. There are people that look at the Bible that same way. You look at what you like, you, you take what you like, and you spit everything out. That is not how we treat the Word of God. This is not a buffet where you eat lots of pickled herring and skip over the sweet potatoes. This is not something you pick and choose. When the Bible says it, we must do it. We must understand it according to its context. We not, must understand what the Bible is talking about. But there are hard things for you to practice that are found in the Bible. This is one of them. Because it deals with slaves. The word that is translated servant in your Bible is actually a technical word that was used for a household slave. Someone who belonged to a master. And that is a problem for people. I thought slavery was terrible. Why didn't Paul say, slaves, rebel against your masters and burn it down from the top down. Just destroy everything. Isn't that what we're taught? If somebody does something you don't like, you just burn it down? Well, that's what we're seeing today, isn't it? And beloved, that is sin. This deals with slaves, and you understand, why didn't Paul address that institution of slavery? Well, one of the problems is that their economy depended on slavery. In the Roman Empire, between 30 and 40 percent of the entire population were slaves. They belonged to their master. There was no political power in Paul. There's nothing Paul could have done to change anything. Nothing the slaves could have done to change anything. It was a situation that they could not change, but it was a situation in, what, in where God can work. One example of a certain slave in Paul's day and age was a man by the name of Philemon. If you read the book of Philemon, or a, um, a man by the name of Onesimus, Philemon is the book that is written about him. He was a runaway slave. He probably absconded with a bunch of money, and it very well could have been money that was meant to support the Apostle Paul. And Paul said, you need to forgive him. And if he owes you anything, put it on my account, as you also know you owe me, you owe me your whole life. Paul led this guy to Christ. Paul didn't reject that institution, but he said, welcome him not as a servant or a slave, but as a brother. Christianity changes every institution it touches. By the way, Philemon or Onesimus, or perhaps both, and ended up in the ministry. Um, at the church at Ephesus. It may have been very well that Onesimus carried the book of Ephesus in his little backpack back home to his master Philemon. That's kind of an interesting thought. Slavery was something that was going to take place and something they had to put up with. And we can apply it to this day and age. There are things in life that are unfair. There are things in life that just are not right. We still follow God and we do what God wants us to do. In this case, Peter said, you slaves, you servants, you house servants, 
Be submissive to your masters. That word submit or submissive is used now the third time in this chapter. It's going to be used more, by the way, in this chapter. But the Bible teaches that the servant was to be submissive. Submission is the hardest thing that we as children of Adam deal with. Because I don't want to submit. I want to do my own thing, my own way, and do what I want to do it in the way I want to do it. And if we move this to today's day and age, when my boss tells me to do something, well, I might get around to it if I feel like it. That's kind of our attitude. Submission means you stand under, as in a military rank. That you do what you are told in the parameters of the Word of God. In other words, if I'm told to disobey God, I accept the punishment. I accept what's going to happen, and I may end up being fired because of my faith in Jesus Christ. Because I, I will say, I do not want to do that. Or better yet, I don't think God wants me to do that. And so I will not do that. And you may get your notice on the spot. We accept those consequences. Understand that. We don't refuse to submit because we don't feel like it. We refuse to submit when we are forced to go against our conscience. And here's what we're reading. In verse 18, it says, We are to submit to the good and the gentle master. That's easy, isn't it? You got a good boss? It's pretty easy to do what they tell you to do. You got a boss that treats you well, treats you fair, treats you in a patient way? That's pretty easy to do what they tell you to do. The next phrase isn't quite so easy. But also to the harsh. The word translated harsh is a Greek word, skolios. Okay, now we understand that because of scoliosis. Scoliosis is a curvature of the spine where someone who is um, healthy in every way, someone's spine is curved wrong and it affects everything about them. I have a dear pastor, now he, he was a missionary and could not go back to the field because he had a child with scoliosis and they couldn't treat them on that mission field. You see, that little girl is bent physically. Paul isn't talking about a physical bend here. He is saying, don't, don't just submit to the good master. Submit to the master that is bent. Ooh. You mean the one that's twisted? The one that is just not right morally or emotionally? God tells me that it's not only a master with a good heart, but the abusive and unfair master that I am commanded to submit to. Your boss might not be fair with you. You might get all of the rotten jobs out there. And they may do it because they know you're a Christian. They may do it because they know that you follow the Lord and you're going to do it. I've been in places where the Christians didn't expect. I, I know of one story where the lead man in this factory where he worked found the, the, the rottenest job he could find in the plant to put the Christians on. I still remember, and then he would scream at them the whole time on the way they were doing it and how they were doing it. I still remember lunch break with one of them says, man, I just want to put this guy's in the head in this. He was running a 500-ton pet press. I just want to put his head in the press and push the buttons. And I said, is that what God would want you to do? No. I found out later the reason this lead man did that was because he was testing them to see if they really believed what they said they believed. 
I found that out later. Because I couldn't understand. He, um, I worked for a very kind, very good guy in that factory. He was a Christian individual. In fact, he used to say, we want some of you Baptist Bible boys, but this time bring a great big one. They were going to do big tractor tires. We want a great big Baptist Bible boy to come in and apply for a job. I had a great master, and these two guys were friends. The one was not a Christian, and he treated people poorly, but he was putting them to the test. God says that we are to submit to those who are twisted by sin. Now, Peter also told the Sanhedrin that you decide whether to obey you or God. We're going to obey God. We understand that. That's not the issue here. You may have an employer. You may have a boss that makes your life difficult for one reason. It is because you love the Lord and want to serve the Lord. And they make your life hard. Now, we have it pretty nice in this country. If you don't like a job, you can, find, you can look for another job. You can always get a, you know, find another job. You might have to uh, go with less pay. You might have to go with worse working conditions. You might actually have to work. <laughs> um, but, beloved, God tells us we are to submit to those who are in charge of us regardless of whether we like it or not. We should never be the employee that challenges our authority. You know, I, I heard this. Um, it wasn't a job I was on. I just heard this employee screaming back at his boss, says, you're not the boss of me! And I thought, hmm, who pays his paycheck? <laughs> I think he is. Don't be that guy. Don't be that lady. Don't be that person who is, will not submit to your employer. Do what your employer says. Well, that's hard because it's just not fair. There are bosses that just are not fair. That's an issue of faith. Are you willing to trust God enough to allow someone to treat you poorly? and still serve God. I'll give you one example. There was a young guy taken from the land of Israel. He was taken from his family. He was mutilated by the capturing army. He was sent, given a different language, given different food, which he knew he couldn't eat and still follow God. He was even given a different name so that they could wipe out every vestige of what he believed in his life. You might know the guy. He never took that other name, by the way. His name was Daniel. He gave alternatives to something that the king had said, you're going to sin doing this. He gave the king's, um, the, the head, the eunuchs, an alternative, and God blessed them. Daniel was a man who submitted to authority. He gave other options to the king, and it ended up that Daniel was in power as far as running the country for three dynasties. He lived his whole life calling the shots in his country because he followed God. Beloved, when you suffer because of your faith in God, you need to trust in the living God. Look, with, look at Matthew chapter 5 with me for a minute. Jesus is giving principles of the kingdom. Jesus is telling us how we are to live in the kingdom. And in Matthew 5, verse 43, the Lord said, You've heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Yeah, I grew up that way. Here's what Jesus said. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? 
Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Therefore you shall be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus tells us a different way to handle those who oppose us and those who hate us. And not one time does he say rail back at them. Not one time does he say give them what for. I've often thought of this. You know why I don't like to submit? And why when somebody treats me bad, I want to answer them back in a harsh way? It's because of my pride and because my life is about me. And I'm worried about poor little me and how bad little me is when treated. And we're going to see later in this chapter, our life is not to be centered in me. It's to be centered in the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter lays it out and gives us a command. And he says... You are to have an attitude of submission because here's what happens. When you submit to God, according to verse 19, this is commendable. Now that word commendable, we might translate, it's the Greek word charis. The same word is translated grace. This is grace. This is what God does for you. Grace is God giving you what you don't deserve. God blessing you when you deserve no blessings. This is commendable. This is grace. If because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. You, when you suffer wrongfully in any area, if you take it patiently, if you trust God through that, if you let God work through that, God opens up or unfolds His grace upon you. In other words, God is going to bless you. Now immediately people's mind, oh, you mean I'm going to get rich. That's not what it's saying. God will bless us. When we trust him in difficult circumstances and let him control the situation. You know what's not commendable? Verse 20, what credit is it if when you're beaten for your faults you take it patiently? Okay, the word beat literally means to be punched with a fist. I've never had a boss punch me with a fist. I've never had a boss do anything physically to me. But in that day and age, you might have a boss who just smacks you. As some friends of mine call it, dots the eye. You know, just... But Peter says, now, there's no grace if it's your fault. There is no grace if you suffer because you have done wrong. Again, I go back to the factory where I worked. There was another guy who was a Christian. Another guy who was a Baptist Bible boy, as my supervisor called him. Another guy who just felt like they treated him just awful. And yeah, he got cussed at a lot. He got yelled at a lot. He got treated poorly for two reasons. He was lazy and he was mouthy. Okay? He did not want to do the work. What's funny is his um, supervisor called the lead man that a few of us work for said, hey, can I trade you employees? Because <laughs> he was lazy and, and the supervisor would get on his case and he would answer back. Um, he didn't work there very, very long, by the way. Um, we had 180 day probation. I think he made day 90. Um, I made almost 180 days and then they were going to lay us off and 
I, and um, I ended up, they changed their, their decision. They didn't lay any of us off because I was asked, what are you going to do on your vacation? I said, what vacation? I have a job tomorrow. I know another place that's hiring. I said, well, what do you do when we call you back? I said, because what they would do is take you the 180 days and lay you off and then rehire you so that you didn't get the benefits. Um, that's kind of the way they did it. It's interesting, this guy, the supervisor couldn't wait to get rid of. Those of us in our department couldn't wait to keep us. This guy felt so persecuted, so hurt, so damaged by his boss, but frankly, he asked for his own treatment. There are a lot of Christians who complain about how poorly they are treated and how terrible, and they try to make it a faith thing. Well, they just don't like me because they, I'm a Christian. No, they just don't like you because you don't want to work. I mean, that's what it comes down to. And Peter says, there's nothing in it for you. Listen, if you are treated poorly, because it is your fault, because you don't want to do the job, you're lazy, you are, you've got another issue going on that is basically your fault, there's no benefit to you. But, if you suffer because of conscience, wrongfully, God is going to bless you. We don't like to take abuse without answering it. We don't like to be treated wrongfully and suffer. And beloved, I know other stories of people who have been let go of in a job simply because they were Christians and would not do wrong. I know of a couple of occasions of people who were told, well, we want you to fudge on this law a little bit. If you will do that, we will not only keep you on, we're going to give you a great big bonus. And I know people who've said, I'm not going to do that. I have a friend who was in sales and was told that if you will sell this for this price, I'm going to give you a, back then we, they didn't have big screens, it was, a, it was a projection TV, just so you know how long ago it was, that if you will cheat on this deal and fudge the numbers, I'll, I will buy you a flat screen TV. He said no. The downside is he lost a contract that probably would have gotten his company close to a million dollars. And they simply said, we don't want to buy from you. That's wrongful treatment. But God will bless you. God will pour his blessings out on you if you are willing to trust God even when you are treated poorly. So here's what God's telling us. If you want God's blessings, if you want rewards in heaven, if you want God to do great things in your life, let him treat you bad because of your faith. Rejoice in how you were treated. Back in the book of Acts, they were told no longer preach in the name of Jesus. They were told that you no longer should do what you've been doing as far as sharing Christ as Savior. In Acts chapter 4, they thank God. They praise God. In Acts chapter 5, after they were beaten, we read in verse um, 40, and they agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, that means laid it open, laid their backs open with, with whips, they commanded they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And of course, our reaction would be, boo-hoo, wah, wah. They're so persecuted, so terrible, things are so hard. Look at their reaction. In verse 41. So they departed from the presence of the council 
rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for this name, for the shame of his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as a Christ. When you are persecuted wrongfully because of your faith, God blesses you to the point where you can rejoice and you're counted worthy for his name. Because God's grace will always accompany your pain. It doesn't matter what you go through in life. It doesn't matter what hard times you're enduring even right now. God's grace is always there for your pain to bring you up. Because we have an example. We have got a call. And our calling is not to be wealthy. Our calling is not to be healthy or happy. Our calling is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you look in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, we're going to elaborate on this next week. For this, to this you were called. This is what you've been called to. Because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Remember the fad a few years ago? WWJD. Remember that? What would Jesus do? It's still around. And um, <laughs> it was kind of interesting. I talked to someone who um, worked the jewelry counter. I think it was at Walmart. And they'd mentioned the most shoplifted item they had in their jewelry counter were bracelets that said WWJD. Hmm. That doesn't quite make sense. We have not been called to a life of ease. The Lord has called us to take up our cross and follow him. Luke chapter 9 says this. Talking about Bible term. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, I'm going to make you happy, healthy, and prosperous. No, it doesn't say that. Okay? If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. God has never called us to a life of ease. God has never called us to a life of wealth and prosperity. God has called us to take up our cross and follow Jesus. And I think we've lost that in this day and age. I don't want a religion that makes me comfortable. I don't want a religion that makes me happy and wealthy. In fact, just yesterday I was talking to somebody about wealth and prosperity and the prosperity preachers. We won't go there. I want a relationship with Jesus Christ to where he says, take up your cross and follow me. I want to sacrifice for the Lord because he sacrificed for me. I don't want an easy feather bed religion. I want a dynamic, sacrificial relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what this is saying. Your calling is to follow Jesus. I wonder how many people with the WWJD bracelets saw that the calling was to be taking up their cross or to be sacrificed to a God-rejecting, Christ-hating world. We've been called to follow Jesus. And Jesus suffered for us. I cannot imagine the physical suffering our Savior took. As you read about the road to the cross, as you in your mind's eye see bloody footprints left behind where you could track Jesus all the way to, to the cross because of the blood drops and the footprints that were etched in blood. 
you realize that Jesus suffered terribly for our sake. When I think of the cross and what my Savior did for me and one word's got to come out, that wasn't fair! He never sinned. Next week's message gets into that, but when he was reviled, he didn't, re he didn't answer back! It wasn't fair what they did to Jesus. And I better phrase it differently. It wasn't fair what I did to Jesus. Because it was my sin that sent him to the cross. It was my sin that caused him to be beaten bloody and nailed to a cross and have his heavenly father turn his back on the son and forsake him. Christ suffered for us. You know what's interesting is the, um, there's a different manuscript family that has this verse. And this different manuscript family, it's in the majority text. It says, for Christ suffered for you. Do you think you're above ill treatment? Jesus suffered for you. Do you think you don't have to put up with unfairness? Jesus suffered for you. And he leaves us an example. That's kind of a technical word. It's a Greek word, and I'm going to try to pronounce it here. Hypographimon. Graphamon. That's it. Hypographimon. Um, that means a lot to you, doesn't it? The word means an underwriting, and, and what it is is an example that you have a picture. I was going to do this, but we don't have the boxed-in pulpit anymore. I shouldn't still, still done it. I was going to draw my version of the Mona Lisa. It was going to be a stick figure, you know. <laughs> um, what the word is, is a pattern, an example that you write after, that students were to copy. Perhaps the best example was when I was in elementary school. Now, I know this is going to fly over the heads of some of you, okay, just because of my age. They had on the wall at the front of the school, remember that? The cursive A. I can still do cursive. B. C. And we had to, as students, in our lined notebook with our number two pencils, look at that and write A. I, I know it didn't carry over into my adult life when you see my writing now. But actually, I had good penmanship in elementary school. You had to copy that writing and have it exact, and then the teacher would come along and say, no, you need to make the, the bottom of the F a little longer. And um, that was the pattern, the example that we were to follow. And here's what this is saying. Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example, a pattern that we are to follow. I'm not an artist. I could never draw Mona Lisa in a million years. But I think I can do the alphabet of how to follow Jesus. God has called you to trace your life after the life of my Savior. That is our calling. And his life was that of a man of sorrows. 
His life was that of suffering. I have a duty to fulfill, to walk in Jesus' footsteps. We're always told, now you don't criticize anybody till you walk a mile in their shoes. You know what this verse is telling me? I'm to walk my life in Jesus' sandals. We have been given a duty to follow Christ. You began following Christ when you placed your trust in Jesus alone for your salvation. The fact that he died for your sins, he, ro he, he was buried, and he rose again. And he paid the penalty for your sins, and you began to follow. Well, here is your duty. And it's really easy. You just walk in his footsteps. It's really, you know, we got Christians with all these rules and regulations. And I'm not saying that rules aren't bad. I got my own rules, things I'm not going to do and things I am going to do. I got a rule. I, first thing in the morning, my rule is I'm going to have my Bible open. Well, actually, it's this thing. My Bible on it. <laughs> That's my rule. That's not a bad rule to have. But we have all of these rules and regulations that Christians are to follow. And frankly, there's only one rule you need to follow. I'll give it to you. There's only one rule our church will support. Now that goes in a way, that as you look at the rule, how you're going to live. Only rule? Following Jesus' footsteps. To follow after Him. The only rule you need in life is to imitate Christ. You know what? If I'm imitating Christ, I'm, I'm going to say no when they say, hey, what kind of beer do you drink? And I go, I don't drink. Because I'm following Jesus. And I'm not saying that he never had perhaps a very small percentage wine. What I'm saying is I don't drink because I want to follow Jesus. And if I start drinking, I know I'm not. I don't have to worry about screaming back at my employers. I got to worry about following Jesus. I don't have to worry about when a protester gets in my faith and, and tells me I'm a terrible, unloving, unkind, wicked human being and screaming. I don't have to worry about screaming back at them. I'm going to follow Jesus. You see, our example in life is not to promote ourselves, it is to follow Jesus. Our goal in life is not to free, feed our ego or our pride. Our goal is to follow Jesus. And in every situation that you find yourself in, in the times of your suffering, God has called you to follow Jesus. Period. Our call has never been to be at ease. It has always been to sacrifice. God's call to you today is not to fill your, your, your bank account full and, and have a life of ease and avoid conflict at all costs. God's call to you is for conflict and sacrifice. Our conflict is with the Word of God. We share the gospel with people, and the conflict will come. We are called to reflect the Lord Jesus in every situation in life. Now, I'm saying that as your preacher, do I always do it? I wish I did. But my goal needs to be to follow Jesus. To reflect the nature of Jesus in every area of life. We've not been called to a potluck. You know, I saw a little deal the other day of a Baptist pastor losing criti critical loss of weight or great weight loss pound, lost 50 pounds because we can't have potlucks anymore um, because of the COVID. Our call isn't to potluck or to picnics. Our call is to sacrifice for Jesus 
and reflect the image of Christ who suffered for us. Let me ask you, what are you willing to sacrifice so that someone can know Jesus as their Savior? Are you willing to sacrifice your pride? Are you willing to put up with a little bit of verbal abuse? To be called the Holy Roller? To be called the Bible Thumper? And there are other things. Are you willing to endure abuse that they might know Jesus as Savior. A missionary I haven't seen for a long, long time. Steve Shook, missionary to Japan. Sitting in the house, he told us all kinds of things. He's deaf, by the way. Sent to the deaf school in Iowa. He witnessed to his classmates. And as he witnessed... They did not like it. And eventually they held him on the floor and burned him with cigarettes. You know what he did the next day? He told them he loved them and gave them the same message. <laughs> he told about passing out tracks in San Francisco. They'd take it, look at it, crumple it up, throw it on the ground. He'd pick it up and give it back to them. Straighten it and give it back to them. He was willing to sacrifice because Jesus sacrificed for him. Beloved, are you willing to sacrifice for Jesus? The song we are going to sing was written by a gentleman who went to the headhunters. He was saved. He was one of their tribe. He went back to them. He witnessed to them and told them what he was living. The chief said, you will recant Christ or we will kill your children before your eyes. And he said the words, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. He was told, no one's going to follow you. No one's going to be on your side. No one's going to help you. And if you don't recant, we will kill your wife. And he said, no, no one, no one join. Um, I have decided the second verse. I'll bring it up. My brain has gone. He says, though no one join me, still I will follow. And before his death, he said these words, the world behind me, the cross before me. He knew what it was like to follow Jesus. This morning, our call, it's to submit to cruel, bent, twisted employers for the sake of the gospel. Our call is to follow Jesus in every situation. So will you follow him? Let's pray. Father, today we come again to you. And we think of the sacrifice our Savior made and we are broken. To realize how, how much pain he endured so that we could have eternal life. Father, we come to you today realizing that that's our call to follow Jesus. This morning, Father, speak to our hearts. Help us to make that commitment to follow Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing the song to close. I have decided to follow Jesus. If you have a spiritual need... Just come talk to me after the service. We'd love that. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. 